Coffee. Coffee no! <laughs> I got to say that as a second lieutenant, but there were twelve guys standing in front of me. It wasn't quite the same thing. Well, I want to get I want to get to the newly reelected governor of New Jersey, the uh, Tony Soprano lookalike that that now thinks he sees a president when he shaves in the morning. Um, he's got some connections to to Islam that are not public record much, but they're also pretty scary. But you know a lot more about it than I do. Tell us what those are about. Well, it's a kind of microcosm of the larger problem that we talk about a lot, Greg, over these uh, many, many months and years, namely the efforts that those who would have us believe they're not our enemies because they advocate imposing Sharia upon us by stealth rather than violently, Uh, the success that they've had in, in penetrating our civil society institutions and our and our governing uh, agencies and and it just as I said happens that Chris Christie's been a particularly dramatic example of this uh, uh, the success that they've had. Uh, there's a, a fellow by the name of Katanani who is a radical imam out of I believe Patterson, New Jersey, uh, and back before Christie ran for governor the first time around, uh, the Department of Homeland Security tried to deport uh, Imam Katanani on the grounds that uh, that he was promoting jihadism and was otherwise, uh, you know, one of these uh, dangerous incubators of uh, the, the, the threat, perhaps of the violent kind, not just of the stealthy kind. Governor Christie, at the time, of course, was a U.S. attorney, sent his deputy U.S. attorney to testify against the U.S. government agency that was trying to effect this deportation, uh, serving as kind of a character witness for Katanani. <laughs> and for. then, get this, and then uh, when they successfully quashed the deportation effort, uh, and the governor uh, at the time, a candidate for governor, was running for the job. Uh, he managed to uh, obtain an awful lot of support from the Muslim community, which is particularly uh, strong in places like Patterson, New Jersey. Once he became governor, he placed the uh, lawyer who was representing Katsumani in that proceeding on, uh, I believe, the Superior Court of, uh, of the state of New Jersey. And I just happened to catch, uh, this is a little bit more probably than you bargained for, but it's, <laughs> it's, fine, it's huh? rich information. I, I happened to catch on the occasion of uh, the Eid event, uh, the breaking of the fast celebration that uh, Muslims do, uh, last year, as I recall, uh, the governor presiding over uh, an event in the governor's mansion, in the, uh, I guess, lawn, backyard, whatever, of the mansion, at which he sang the praises of some of those present, which included both Katanani and his lawyer, among others, and he denounced, as he is wont to do, as bigots and racists and Islamophobes, people who said, you know, this isn't really a good idea. Um, It's a very worrying record, in short. So what's the, what's the genesis of this? What, 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 what's the hook? Well, I think it's a calculation on the part of this uh, political, uh, clearly ambitious guy that, uh, that if he does what people like Grover Norquist uh, in Washington have been recommending, which is to make a play for the Muslim-American vote by lashing up with people who profess to be leaders of that community – irrespective of the fact that they also happen to be Muslim Brotherhood operatives or, or worse, um, that you'll get a, 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 you know, a constituency that can help you win elections. And I, I, the fact that he, as has Grover, gone over the top in defending these guys and denouncing people who raise legitimate concerns about what they're doing and what their agenda is and how far they're succeeding in getting it accomplished – 
uh, is is you know right out of uh, the Norquist playbook, and and you know unfortunately it oh it uh, it, it is an ominous uh, omen for what is to come. I'm afraid. Well, I'm, I'm scratching my head here. Now, Norquist ended up marrying a Muslim woman, and one one can't know how long that went on <clears throat> before it became a marriage to change the the way he thought. But a guy like Christie, um, I always am, maybe it's just the old broken down prosecutor, prosecutor in me. I'm still trying to figure out why. What's the hook? What's the connect? What's the, the, people just don't do this. You know, you don't, you don't just be an American politician with relatively good roots. I mean, by New Jersey standards, he's conservative. He's sure not by ours, but and a guy that's, you know, been a tough guy ready to take on the unions. Or, and, and or a federal thing. prosecutor. You know, federal prosecutor. <laughs> I, there's a hook there someplace, Frank. And, and if it, I don't, do you see it? Am I missing something? Why, why would a guy do something so, as they say in the law, demonstrably irrational for somebody that can't do him any good anyway? Well, uh, point one, I, I happen to have done a course on, uh, among other things, Grover Norquist's involvement in all of this uh, at MuslimBrotherhoodInAmerica.com. I commend it to people who want to get to the bottom of this. But as to Christie, uh, Greg, look, I think um, he made a rank political calculation when he was U.S. attorney. I'm going to run for governor. I want to get this constituency. If I help this guy out who's prominent in Patterson, he'll help me get sufficient numbers of that constituency to be able to win the governorship the first time around. Uh, it's the kind of calculation, frankly, that Grover helped uh, Carl Rove make for George W. Bush when he was running for president in, in 2000. It's the kind of calculation other politicians have made. And, and you asked the right question, of course, and that is, how does a guy whose job as U.S. attorney is to know about these sorts of threats and to deal with them effectively to protect all of us against uh, a, a, an internal enemy, which I consider the Muslim Brotherhood and its civilization jihad to be, by their own words. They say they're about our destruction from within, by our own hands. How does a guy who's got that particular job at that particular time, never mind what he aspired to, but that particular job, how does he, in good conscience, ignore what he is supposed to know? It, it's malfeasance, I'm afraid. Frank Gaffney, our guest, right back with a bunch more. Stick around. It was a year 2000 uh, phenomenon. Frank Gaffney knows his story very well. But I was I was convinced to my the soles of my shoes that it was real. And little by little, from Travelers Insurance to um, the Indianapolis Power and Light Company, people decided to stop scoffing, and they discovered that we were right, and they fixed it. Well, we got a thing to face now called the EMP, electromagnetic pulse, that Frank is steeped in. And I want you once again to give us the, the, a little bit of the, the quick primer on this and talk about just how dangerous this is and, and maybe the question next, question next, what to do about it. Well, Greg, this is a very timely conversation because next week uh, there is uh, an exercise that is begun, going to be conducted across the country uh, by something called the North American Electric Reliability Corporation, better known as by its acronym NERC and by something like 100 um, electric utilities. And it's supposed to examine what happens uh, in the event that there are disruptions of the power grid. Uh, something that I'd like to think um, the mind's been concentrated on uh, as a result of something I think we talked about last week, this uh, terrific film that National Geographic aired two weeks ago called American Blackout. And to answer your question, what this is all about really is fundamentally that the kind of uh, Rube Goldberg or, or Jerry Belt electric grid we have, the power distribution system around the country, it's, it's a small miracle it works as well as it does, frankly, because it's, it's grown like Topsy and it's, uh, it's got a lot of vulnerabilities. And unfortunately, there are bad people enemies of this country who understand 
not only what those vulnerabilities are, but how they could exploit them to essentially crater the grid and thereby deny us as a nation for potentially years on end the kind of power that makes modern day life in the 21st century possible. That sounds unbelievable, and it sounds, as you say, like you know science fiction or, or maybe threats of yesteryear. The trouble is five different, minimum, five different federal studies, by some estimates even seven studies, depending on who's counting, have looked at this problem and concluded that either because of uh, intense solar flaring activity or because of something called electromagnetic pulse, which could be generated by a bomb, a nuclear weapon being detonated uh, high above the country, or because in a more localized way, but perhaps over large areas, people go after key parts of the grid, the transformers that are its backbone could be taken down. And with it, you would have the country plunged into the kind of darkness that National Geographic sort of uh, played out in its scenario. Uh, they, they looked at a cyber attack, by the way, which is another way to do this. But the bottom line is this. If this grid exercise next week is uh, going to track with past practice of Merck and the electric utilities, they're going to lowball this problem. They're going to encourage people to think it's not a problem. They're going to hope that nobody's going to notice that, in fact, these studies have concluded it is and, indeed, that it could be catastrophe if it plays out. And I'm hoping uh, that an educated public and an alert Congress and, who knows, maybe even a media that is taking this seriously, because all of our lives are on the line. By one estimate, by one of those commission chairmen, uh, the, the Blue Ribbon Congressional Commission that studied the EMP threat for the Congress some years ago, the, the chairman was an old friend of mine and colleague in the Reagan administration. He said, if this power grid fails for over a year, over oh. wide areas of the United States, yeah. nine out of ten of us are going to die. Yeah. So what you're saying, Frank, is we're screwed. <laughs> well, unless we fix it before any of that stuff happens. And the good news about that is it's not that costly. It won't take that long. It doesn't have to be that hard. The, the military has been hardening key uh, components of its forces, specifically the nuclear forces, for 50 years against EMP. They've understood this threat. So it's not that we don't know what to do or how to do it. It's just that we have to get off the dime and do it. And again, unfortunately, the electric utilities, who you'd think have as big a stake as anybody in this, have been dragging their feet or worse, trying to obscure the fact that the problem exists at all. In fact, there was a press release put out by one of the utilities down in Florida after this uh, film ran at National Geographic said, no need to panic. <laughs> Never mind, folks. <laughs> Nothing to see here. Just move along. There's a lot to, not to panic about, but to get working on fixing. And that's where we need the public's help. And I appreciate you allowing me to talk why, about why that. Why are they... Washington Times today about it as well. But Why are they resisting the change or not cooperating here? Well, it's money, and they didn't reasons. think of it. Todd seemed to be one that uh, they don't want to absorb the costs, and I don't know why they think that. They pass the costs of everything else on to the consumer, um, and, and it looks like the cost of fixing the transformer vulnerability would be about $0.50 cents per rate payer 